Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming uh, here today. Two days ago, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 outbreak to be a global pandemic. Yesterday, Saskatchewan's chief medical officer declared the first presumptive case of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan. And today, Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer has confirmed a second presumptive case of COVID-19 in our province. And I know the emergence of, of this pandemic is creating great uncertainty for families and communities across Saskatchewan. People across this province are, are wondering what this means for them. Families are worried about the impact that COVID-19 could have on their community and, and on their family members. And as a father, I most certainly understand this. As a premier, I most certainly understand this. And I can assure you that the entire government of Saskatchewan also understands this. Over the last several weeks, the Ministry of Health, led by the Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Shahab, has been coordinating a province-wide effort to prepare Saskatchewan for the arrival of COVID-19. And this provincial effort has also been coordinated with the federal government, the, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and provincial government, as well as provincial governments and health authorities, again, across the nation. With the arrival of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan, I'd like to express my confidence and the confidence of the government of Saskatchewan in the efforts of Dr. Shahab, in the efforts of public health officials and Saskatchewan's health care system. I want to say how grateful I am for the professionalism and the de dedication of all of those that are working in the Saskatchewan health care system. We know that as the number of cases of COVID-19 rise in Saskatchewan, there will be some pressures in our health care system. And I want to assure the people that all of the necessary resources will be made available to support the diligent effort that is already underway. Not only to address the pressures, but to ensure that we are able to respond as quickly as possible to the needs as they arise. Saskatchewan's Emergency Operation Command has, has been activated for the last week to serve as a central point in coordinating the efforts of all public agencies in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan during this response. Early to the, earlier today, Canada's premiers spoke with the Prime Minister, as well as Dr. Tam, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, for a discussion specific to Canada's coordinated response to COVID-19. The Prime Minister provided some additional detail with respect to the $1 billion in funding that has been committed by the federal government to address this situation, including $500 million that has been earmarked for the provinces and territories. Of this federal funding, Saskatchewan will receive a per capita share of $15.6 million. This funding will be targeted specifically to support COVID-19 response within our health system here in Saskatchewan. In discussions with the Prime Minister, the Premiers were asked to identify priorities and to address COVID-19 from, from across the country. Many indicated that this is a critical time for infrastructure flexibility as well as infrastructure funding. And the Premiers also raised the importance of of availability of supplies, which could include testing kits, as well as personal protection equipment, or PPE. These are the areas that the Saskatchewan Ministry of Health and the Saskatchewan Health Authority are monitoring carefully, as there are other provincial health authorities with similar concerns across the country. But as a province, we cannot leave this effort solely to our health system to react and to respond as new cases may arise. We must take the, pers the, we must take the personal and community responsibility that we know we need to, to ensure we are being proactive in preventing the spread of, of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan. So today, the government of Saskatchewan is announcing a number of aggressive new measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our province. The Chief Medical Health Officer of Saskatchewan has made the following order, pursuant to Section 45 of the Public Health Act, and it will be effective Monday, March the 16th. The Chief Medical Health Officer orders that no public gathering of over 250 people in any one room should take place. This does not include settings where people are distributed into multiple rooms, multiple buildings, such as schools, universities, or workplaces. The Chief Medical Health Officer's orders, orders that no events with over 50 people, with speakers or attendees who have traveled internationally in the last 14 days, should also should either should take place. Retail locations and faith-based organizations are exempt. However, they should also have measures such as crowd size monitoring that support the safe social distancing that we have discussed and should seek guidelines from 
both local medical health, both from the uh, local medical health officer if they feel necessary. And effective immediately, people though, who have traveled outside of the province in, in the previous 14 days or who ha are, do have symptoms of acute re re repository or flu-like symptoms should avoid visiting long-term care homes and hospitals. In addition to this, the government of Saskatchewan, as an employer, is imposing a number of policies regarding government employee travel. So effective immediately, international travel, including travel to the U United States of America for government employees on government business has been prohibited. Any out of province travel for government employees on, on government business within the Canada will be restricted and is subject to the approval of the Deputy Minister to the Premier. Any government employees who are currently traveling internationally, including to the USA, or plan to travel internationally for personal reasons, they will be required to self-isolate for 14 days after returning to Canada. This is a precaution. If they have or they develop any acute respiratory or flu-like symptoms, they should contact 811. All government employees who are experiencing systems of an acute respiratory or, or flu-like illness will be required to stay at home or to contact 811. While these measures are being implemented as a policy for the government of Saskatchewan ministries, the crowns and, and the agencies, the chief medical health officer strongly recommends that all employers and individ individuals across the province follow these practices. This will help us limit the spread of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan. It will help to protect residents from exposure to the virus, and it will reduce the impact of COVID-19 on our healthcare system, essentially flattening the curve. In keeping with these new policies, budget day events on Wednesday, March the 18th, they will proceed, but they will proceed without the participation of invited guests. This decision was made after discussions with the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly. Members of the Legislative Assembly, media, and, and a limited number of staff will be authorized to gather for these events while also practicing social distancing. Further, after consulting with the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, it's, it's been decided that all tours and all public events at the Legislative Building are being suspended, and general public access to the Legislative Building is also being suspended. Our government is also taking measures to, to increase our capacity to handle COVID-19 in Saskatchewan. Concerns regarding the capacity of the health line, 811, have been heard. Following an action plan ordered by the Minister of Health, the capacity of the health line, the 811 health line, has been more than doubled, effective as 9 o'clock a.m. this morning, with additional capacity that will be, be being added in the very near future. The Ministry of Health and the Saskatchewan Health Authority continue to work together to expand testing capacity for COVID-19, and that includes the introduction of a COVID-19 assessment sites across the province over the coming days. While these are significant steps that will help limit the transmission of COVID-19, most important is the responsibility that we all have to ensure that we do what we can to reduce the risk to ourselves, reduce the risk to our families, and reduce the risk to our communities. And the best way that we can do this is to practice social dis distancing, to wash our hands and wash our hands often, to avoid close personal contact like handshakes or hugs, and to self-isolate if we feel any of the symptoms, any symptoms of illness. So before I conclude, I, I would like to thank personally Dr. Shahab for, for his work and all of the men members of the Saskatchewan medical community for their dis diligence in preparing for COVID-19 in Saskatchewan, and for their dedication over the coming weeks as we work together to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. Dr. Shahab. Thank you, Premier. So um, I would just like to add briefly that uh, I'll just speak a bit about uh, the, our second uh, presumptive case, um, and then just reinforce some of the comments that the Premier made about the enhanced uh, preventive measures. So regarding the second case, um, it was a person in his 60s who traveled from Oregon State in the USA, um, arrived in Saskatoon March 10, um, and was not feeling well and self-isolated at home. So we don't expect a lot of contacts, and we want to reassure that public health is currently interviewing and following up with all contacts who need to be aware to uh, self-monitor or self-isolate, depending on their exposure. 
so we have now two presumptive cases, more than 300 tests done, um, and we are certainly, um, like the Premier said, uh, ramping up testing where people have traveled from anywhere in the world, as well as people who may have gone to large conferences and event or events and may have any symptoms of concern. Um, the second thing um, I'd just like to highlight is that we have had, uh, we have a provincial uh, operations center where all the sectors meet daily, and we have had one-to-one uh, -one discussions with schools and universities. And while um, uh, all sectors are making their own business continuity plans, at this point, there are no plans for school closures. Uh, but uh, if and when that need arises, we will be monitoring this and uh, uh, connecting with our uh, counterparts in education on a daily basis. If and when that need arises, uh, that will be considered. Thank you. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to take them. How long is the order going on in India? How long will the order be in place for? So right now, it has been put in uh, uh, till further notice. And um, um, obviously, these are significant measures. Uh, they limit, uh, they currently limit large gatherings. They currently limit people who have traveled from abroad. <coughs> they certainly don't restrict day-to-day -day business. Uh, we will continue to monitor. If things settle down, obviously, this can be rescinded. If things worsen, you know, the, the order will be amended to put in even more restrictive uh, steps like we discussed and like has happened in other parts of the world. So this currently meets the needs today. But we'll keep monitoring uh, the situation to see what adjustments need to be made in an ongoing fashion. And there may, there may, be, there may be things that are added to, to this action as we go through the days ahead and that we are able to get to a point where, where we look like we have uh, hit our peak and are starting to reduce, then we would look at reducing items that are in this order and other actions that may be taken. Adam, why, why the decision not to close schools uh, to last three presumptive cases on the list? And kids can't be expected to know social distancing. At this point, there, at this point, there are very strict uh, guidelines for people who have coming uh, who are coming back after traveling abroad, and that can include self monitoring and also self isolation in specific circumstances. That is an important first step. There is no evidence in Saskatchewan of community transmission. The other concern is that if you close schools prematurely from for an indefinite period of time. Children can still gather, for example, in people's houses uh, while parents go to work. So we want to minimize social disruption. We want to promote um, as much uh, social distancing as possible within the school setting, and we recognize that it is challenging. But we want to promote that for the time being. But if there was evidence of community transmission locally or province-wide, then further steps, including school closures, can be taken. If there's only two cases and they have, they've had both had limited contact, why take these measures? Well, uh, the measures right now primarily address two things that are of concern in Canada and the U.S. One is they address importation of cases from anywhere in the world. And that has been an increasing concern because uh, over the last two, three weeks, most of the importations have been from Europe and, uh, uh, and from within North America. So it addresses all travel, uh, and, and that's very significant. And the other thing is that we have had instances now in Canada where there has been transmission in large conferences in both Toronto and um, uh, BC. So that is not individuals within Canada traveling overseas, but going to events where there's lots of people from other parts of the world. So similar to cruise ships, large conferences seem to be a risk factor. So this addresses large gatherings and international travel for the time being. Uh, but of course, we will continue to watch the situation, and if we need to uh, m make further restrictions on group settings like schools, uh, that that will be considered. Like with sandwich, things like that, like picking on Costco on a given day, you're gonna have more than a bad example, but, uh, but you're gonna have more than 250 people gathered in the store. Yeah. So, uh, the time is being given for retail organizers to really work that out. And like we discussed earlier, there is wa ways to go into a large, uh, you know, uh, uh, retail organization in a safe manner. Uh, shopping carts, other, uh, uh, you know, automatically maintain that greater than one meter separation. And you just need to be more aware of what's happening and how you maintain that social distancing throughout your activities within a retail organization or other public gathering. So. We think that this is doable. Obviously, even if we went to a stage where there were more restrictive measures, like there are in Italy, 
you know, even th then uh, grocery stores remain open. People do have to go out and shop in a controlled way. So that, that still will continue even with more restrictive measures. But right now, there's a lot of emphasis on social distancing in retail uh, and other settings. Yeah, Dan, 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 Dan. Uh, can you just elaborate on why this was extended to public facilities such as gyms, pools, libraries, where common touching would occur and not be uh, sanitized straight after? So I think this really sets the stage for all settings to consider what they can do to m m maximize social distancing measures, measures and minimize uh, transmission. And again, um, gyms and other places with, with you know where there's multiple touch services, you can use those settings in a safe manner with our current situation. But uh, those settings have to make sure that there's uh, after every use, there's uh, you know cleaning of surfaces, which people should be doing in gyms anyways, but just reinforces basic principles. And but of course, the other thing that I want to emphasize is that if you have an underlying uh, health condition or you are uh, older, you yourself have to think about should you go into certain settings where you may be at higher risk, because that's another part that we all need to consider in terms of our own personal risk assessment. Can you explain how this decision was made, Dr. Shahab? Was it something that you that you made purely on your own authority, or was there some political involvement either from the minister or from cabinet? Well, there's several things. We this has been discussed actively at the tables I sit on, on the Chief Medical Health Officer of Health, and actually yesterday there's extensive discussion on exactly these things, which include uh, a more enhance measures for people uh, who are traveling internationally. And just today, I think the federal government has also announced some significant measures on international travel. Uh, secondly, as you know, we uh, ha had uh, been asked about uh, group events. Other jurisdictions were being asked about that. So there was an ongoing risk assessment, which culminated in us and many other provinces over the last day or two coming to very similar conclusions to minimize transmission. I would just, uh, if I could follow up to that just a little bit, there is uh, interaction uh, between the officials across Canada and in Saskatchewan and the governments that are in place. I was just on a, a well, the minister and I uh, jumped on the operations call this morning with officials from across the province to, uh, to first of all, to thank them and to thank them in, for what they have done and thank them in advance for what we know they are doing and, and continue to do. Uh, second of all was to reassure them that if there are resources that are required, uh, that they, they would be there um, through the Ministry of Health, through the government of Saskatchewan. And, and I would just very publicly like to thank uh, all of those involved in this response thus far. And again, uh, just thank them in advance for, for what we know they are going to do. We then uh, went to a call with the Prime Minister, all of the other Premiers across the nation, as well as Dr. Tam, the Chief Medical uh, Health Officer for Canada, where she uh, provided us with an update, as well as some guidance on what we uh, should and could uh, be doing uh, in each of our respective jurisdictions, for example, uh, educating uh, with respect to, uh, to personal uh, to personal distancing, the personal responsibility that we can help educate uh, the, the people of, of our respective provinces uh, on. Um, some of the action that we can take, uh, educating people on when and maybe when not to uh, enter a long-term care home and ensuring everyone is, or, or a retirement community, ensuring the, the elevated level of risk uh, that we have if, if, uh, if COVID-19 should get into a, a populated uh, uh, care home where, the, where there are a number of el uh, elderly people. Um, what we have done here is take uh, the recommendations and, and support uh, the recommendations, put the full weight of the government of Saskatchewan where we can, uh, behind the recommendations of, of the Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Shahab, here in Saskatchewan, um, when it comes to reducing the risk where we can, um, reducing the risk with respect to the, the cases that we have in Saskatchewan or travel-related cases, we can, uh, we can correlate them to, uh, to someone that has traveled uh, recently, um, as well as to reduce the risk of of having more community uh, transmission, if you will, uh, at large events, uh, community transmission, uh, if you will, uh, at, at uh, you know a, no a number of different uh, uh, op opportunities, I guess, if you, if you will, uh, across the province or in our communities. Uh, so what we are, are trying to do is to reduce that risk. We, we can't eliminate uh, the risk. Um, but the other, the other thing that people can do, each of us, in helping reduce that risk is to um, practice our own our own social responsibility, if you will, in the way of 
of, uh, of personal distancing in the way of if you do have to go to the grocery store and it is a large grocery store to maybe take some some wipes and wipe the uh, the handle of the of the shopping cart down to do take these extra measures that may, maybe you otherwise wouldn't do um, to keep your meter of, uh, of distance between yourself and other shoppers so some some personal uh, responsibility if you will that we're asking people just to be um, somewhat more uh, cognitive of than, than maybe we otherwise would be. So we're trying to reduce the risk where we can from the provincial perspective, uh, and that's on Dr. Uh, Shahab's ab advice, um, but there's also, we're trying to educate people and to ensure they're informed with respect to the, the items that they could do uh, in their own personal daily life to also reduce that risk. And maybe before, uh, at some point, I'd just like ask Dr. Shahab to uh, maybe just uh, run through again um, with respect to when uh, and how you might request a test um, as we are expecting, there will be additional tests. As we now have two cases here in the province, there will be additional test requests. So when and how you would request a test, where you might go for that. And then two, uh, when and uh, you would actually self-isolate and what e exactly the guidelines for self-isolation would be. Thank you. So some of the questions that we are getting from Healthline and from employers are as under, and then just to clarify, once you come from uh, an international trip, uh, so first of all, now going forwards, we don't recommend uh, that you travel extensively internationally. You reconsider your travel plans. But people who are coming back, as soon as they come, sometimes people think, if I get tested now, I'm, 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 I'm fine. And that is incorrect. Uh, if you are asymptomatic, you should avoid large crowds. Uh, you should self-isolate if you've come from high-risk settings or, and monitor your symptoms closely in any case for two weeks. Uh, you should only consider testing if you get symptoms. Uh, a test while you're asymptomatic doesn't mean anything. Secondly, if you're symptomatic, you should call Healthline or you should call ahead if you have to go to see your primary care provider. Your primary care provider will e either let you come to where he or she is or will refer you to an assessment center. That way you minimize exposure to others. And similarly, um, for people who, are, who have not traveled, if you are feeling unwell, you need to self-isolate. Your, uh, your risk is much lower currently, but we have instituted policies where anyone in a hospital setting who has an acute respiratory illness and another cause like influenza has not been found will automatically be screened for COVID-19. And similarly, you know, we are still having outbreaks in long-term care facilities due to influenza. If an outbreak in a long-term care facility is not due to influenza or other respiratory illness, that will be automatically screened for COVID-19. So that's an extra layer where there's no travel, but we want to make sure, like the Premier said, that we prevent as much as we can this impacting the most vulnerable, which is the elderly, people who have underlying risk factors, people in hospitals and long-term care facilities. Thank you. Boss, synagogues, same thing. Synagogues, are, are they like schools or theaters? So uh, again, social distancing should be practiced in every setting, whether it's a religious setting, a school, a uh, university. They're not, and, and even in settings where we meet friends and family. I think that's really important, and I've already seen you know, a reluctance to shake hands if you're meeting friends and family, some social distancing if you're sitting together at someone's house or, or at a social setting. So those principles apply wherever, in personal spaces, public spaces, in you know, uh, religious gatherings, um, uh, schools, universities, um, but certainly they can continue for the time being. The only uh, uh, exception is gatherings where people have come in from international destinations, and that, that should be avoided. I have two questions. Why not make uh, self-isolation mandatory for anybody who's traveled, you know, instead of relying on them to monitor themselves? The, the uh, self-isolation is mandatory for, uh, for people who have come from high-risk areas or are close contacts. That is the recommendation for government employees, um, especially when you can uh, work from home ha or have other means of working. There may be certain situations where it's not required and you can self-monitor where you're not uh, uh, you know, working with large groups of vulnerable people. But self-monitoring is extremely important for two things. One is that at the first sign of um, uh, even mild symptoms, fatigue, cough, you need to immediately self-isolate and seek advice for testing. And secondly, um, right now, this uh, is for, you know, primarily if you've traveled from abroad, 
but we know that if this starts transmitting at a community level, then you will have to self-monitor on an ongoing basis. So you, we all need to learn how to self-monitor, just like we do in flu season, and not go to school or uh, work if you're sick. But we need to do that in a way that we absolutely, at the first sign of cough, and just cough even, we self-isolate and seek um, uh, you know, advice on further assessment. Data from uh, Canadian uh, cases uh, shows that 80% of people have cough and no fever. 40% have cough and fever, or just fever, and uh, only 30% have shortness of breath. So just cough alone is enough for you to self-isolate if you have traveled from abroad with, you know, within 14 days. So my second question relates to our small, smaller rural facilities. Are they able to handle people coming in looking for testing, or do you expect them to all come into the cities for that? So, so far, the way testing has happened is that in the initial stages, we wanted to minimize exposure to anyone else, and testing was done in the home setting when we just had a few tests being required. Uh, then testing, uh, you know, expanded. So in rural settings, if you call ahead to a primary care center or a health facility, testing can be done safely by you driving to a health care facility, going straight to a side room, not waiting in the waiting area, where staff are expecting you, and uh, the uh, swab is taken, and other assessments are done. Uh, in urban areas where the n volume is increasing, that's where the need is for uh, standalone assessment and testing sites. That will take the pressure off, you know, right to primary care clinics uh, or other settings. Just on, on, on that point, on the uh, the testing, we expect uh, that there will be additional tests that will be requested in the in the days and and weeks ahead. And uh, with the the $500 million that has been allocated by the federal government, the, the 15 plus million dollars of that that will be uh, coming uh, to this province. That's most certainly where we're looking at applying some of that funding is, is to exactly how we can enhance our test numbers uh, here in the province, make them more available uh, quickly and uh, more available to all of the people in the province, not just in, in rural areas, but also uh, in, the, in the larger centers as well, understanding uh, there's multiple large buildings with uh, a lot of people in them that maybe need to be tested at times in, in fairly short short order. So that will be a focus of where some of that funding will, will go. And I don't know if you want to speak uh, to any more in depth on that, Minister. No, I think that, uh, that summarizes it. Uh, Dr. Shahab, can you provide more details on these assessment centers? Apparently they're coming in the coming days. How many, where, when are they going to be opening? So um, um, our colleagues in primary care uh, in the SHA are assessing the need throughout the province, not just in Regina and Saskatoon. They're looking at what the demands are currently, what they're projected to be. Right now, they're likely to be stood up within the days in Regina and Saskatoon. But throughout the province, provisions are being made that to make it easier for someone to be safely tested in a timely way, and even in a rural setting, by having a primary care site or a health facility during specific hours of the day, uh, able to just screen people in a very streamlined way that does not disrupt other care. So those details will be uh, becoming publicly available uh, and just to uh, you know, make it easy to get tested in a timely way. Oh, the, the first assessment centers are likely to focus in Regina, Saskatoon. Yes. When are you expecting that they're going to be up, open, running? The information I have is that they are being, you know, uh, tried out as we speak to say, see how the process will work because we want to make sure that what is the intake process? Is it you first call the health line and you refer to a testing center or is there a more streamlined approach? So those details are being worked out today. And so we expect them to be stood up either over the weekend or early next week. Um, I also want to, the, the language you're using in orders, no offense, over 250 or events with 50, like what teeth does that have? Like what, what punishment could there be? What fine? Like what if someone just doesn't listen? So in my experience, uh, for these kind of orders, public health orders, it's very rare for there not to be any compliance. But in, in case there is a lack of compliance, there are remedies under the Public Health Act and disease control regulations through legal channels. Um, but uh, but uh, the option was to make a recommendation or an order. The order is stronger, and uh, it does uh, uh, expect compliance, and there can be remedies under the Public Health Act and regulations that may result in 
you know, penalties uh, if there's non-compliance. But in our experience, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, social pressure to comply with these orders when they're enacted. And if, if, I, if I could, Stephanie, to your point, doctor's right. You, you know, we expect that people are going to comply, but there are significant financial penalty provisions in the act if it ever came to that. Be uh, monitoring, like would you be, I guess, policing, or is it going to depend on someone calling and say, "Hey, I'm supposed to go to this conference; it's not canceled. What should I do?" Or, or is there going to be a proactive monitoring of this? So, <clears throat> medical health officers are already fully engaged with large events that are being uh, happening, and this is being done in a way to minimize disruption of events that can safely happen. Many outdoor events over spring and summer can still safely happen. You know, many things that like, you know, um, 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 uh, group events that where you can maintain social distancing can still safely happen. So I think we need to make sure that, you know, some level of interaction, societal interaction happens in a safe manner. We minimize things where you can, it's hard to maintain social distancing, like large events, and 250 seems to be a number that seems to be the cutoff. And similarly, but for situations where you have international visitors, the number is very small. And that's to minimize the number of people, even with social distancing, who inadvertently could get exposed um, if someone uh, came in, was not self-isolating, and went to a meeting or a, an event. Um, two questions. The first is just kind of a clarification. Would um, there were a couple of exemptions under, under the events. Would a, a wedding count as something that would be uh, banned? I think our recommendation is that any gathering be considered closely on how you can maintain social distancing. So obviously, there can be many personal events in a house or a public space. But currently, uh, gatherings over 250 are problematic because you just can't maintain that. Uh, in an outdoor setting, you can maintain that level of social distancing. And obviously, there's other events that are being planned. Uh, and they will all be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, that what's the setting? What, what are people going to be do? Can they maintain that social distance, that, that one meter separation? And if they can in a safe manner, uh, they could go ahead. But if that, that can't be maintained, the recommendation would be to cancel. The second thing, of course, is who is going to be at those events. The uh, criteria are very strict for international travel. But you know, special considerations could apply for persons if it's going to be a, a, a gathering of people who are health professionals or people who are um, elderly or have uh, underlying risk factors, then additional precautions may apply. So I think this is something that we encourage uh, anyone planning an event to discuss with the local medical health officer. Was, uh, just the other one. Um, how do you know that there's no community transmission if you're declining to test people who haven't traveled or don't necessarily know if they've had contact with a confirmed yeah. case? Yeah, the same thing. So at this point, uh, the most efficient way it seems to be to prioritize people who have traveled, because in Saskatchewan, the two cases were linked to travel. In Canada, the vast majority of cases still are linked to travel or close household contacts of those who traveled. So based on the evidence today, that is the recommendation. Having said that, there have been outbreaks in uh, British Columbia and Washington State in long-term care facilities. So in those settings, we are going to test all outbreaks for COVID-19. And similarly, as an additional layer of protection, any respiratory, severe respiratory illness requiring uh, hospitalization is going to be tested for COVID-19. ERs are also going to have um, the ability to test anyone irrespective. So this way, the most severe manifestations irrespective of travel will be screened. But at this point, opening it up for everyone with uh, a cough would really uh, I think not be efficient in terms of screening out people who are at highest risk at this time. This may change based on what happens in Saskatchewan, what happens in Al uh, Alberta and Manitoba uh, and south of the border. And just, uh, just to follow up on that from our phone call this morning, there's been in excess of 15,000 tests done across Canada with uh, uh, to date, I believe, 157 positive cases uh, as of today. Um, so they're there, there is a large number of tests being done actually per capita. Uh, Canada has done a, a very significant amount of tests. Uh, so there, at this point in time, it seems to be addressing any of the travel-related um, diagnosis that we are, that we're looking for. Just one thing I just want to emphasize, sorry, was that the test is one thing. 
self-isolation immediately when you're symptomatic is very important. It's not just relying on the test alone. Irrespective of travel, that is the other key thing that is really important. And I think that we really have to reinforce, um, even though we're getting out of flu season, that that is the new normal for the foreseeable future. Immediate self-isolation when you have symptoms. And if you haven't traveled, wait for them to get better. If you have traveled, seek further advice for testing. And it seems to me uh, an example of that this week is the prime minister and his family. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. The first one, just focusing on this testing, it, 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 you talked about efficiency. It, it is, would you be able to expand testing still further if there were more resources? I mean, is, is part of the limiting factor only having the one test kit available at the Roy Romano lab? Is there any thought given to expanding that testing capacity? So right now, uh, the, <clears throat> the testing volume um, is keeping up with the capacity of the lab to turn the test around same day or next day. There are discussions to establish additional testing platforms in Saskatoon, for example, as required. The efficiency really means that, for example, right now, if you have a busy uh, family practice with you know, 10, 15 people sitting in the waiting room, if you have a cold or cough, in many cases, you're asked to put on a mask and wait in the waiting room. Uh, we don't really want, uh, it's disruptive for family practices if people throughout the day, day come and say, I have traveled, I have fever, cough, then immediately you have to be self-isolated, tested, and the room has to be cleaned. And certainly don't want someone who's traveled with a cough to sit in a waiting area because if the test is positive, everyone in the waiting area who are close to that case could potentially be contacts. So just to minimize those things, we are you know, recommending the testing sites in large centers. In smaller centers, there may be primary care practices or health facilities that will just do assessment for travel-related fever for part of the day. So that is the streamlining part in terms of how the, pa uh, the patient flow is to minimize uh, you know, the exposure to others who are in a physician's office due to underlying illness and, and at higher risk. Yeah, just on that as well, Arthur, on our call this morning, uh, we discussed we've done just over 300 tests here in Saskatchewan. Other provinces have done in excess of 5,000. We're expecting, and we are keeping up with the demand on tests today. We're expecting that demand to increase, and we feel that we can access uh, the resources in the way of the procedure and the kits. Uh, in saying that, um, nationally and internationally, they're very actively looking at, at what access they would have to different procedures and, and maybe different kits to expand that capacity, not just for Saskatchewan, but for, for all of the provinces and territories. So that work is uh, going on on a collaborative, uh, a collaborative uh, effort, if you will, across Canada. It was a topic of the discussion we had on the call this morning. Yeah. Just, one, just one thing I want to add was that, you know, of the 300 tests in Saskatchewan, two were presumptive positive, the next were negative or had influenza other illnesses. So even in influenza assessment size, just because you've traveled and have a cough and fever doesn't mean you should all sit together. So even in those settings, you want to come one by one. So that's the other piece where you want to minimize exposure to most travelers with a fever cough who are actually don't have COVID-19. So even in those sites, that whole process is being considered very carefully right now about how to minimize exposure. So just a few more details on the new assessment sites. It, it has, have you identified specific facilities in Regina and Saskatoon? What are they? Um, who will be staffing them and how many people? Um, and what kind of PPE will they be? So the Saskatchewan <coughs> Health Authority is working out those details, primarily for Regina and Saskatoon, but I have had discussions with uh, colleagues in other parts of the province as well. The staffing is being worked out as well. Um, uh, currently, uh, the testing at the home setting was being done by uh, home care or public health, uh, nursing staff, uh, medical health officers are also involved. Um, uh, in primary care, testing was done by primary care physicians and nurse practitioners. Obviously, in the hospital setting, testing is done by the clinician who's taking care, either in the ER. Um, for personal protective equipment, um, uh, like we just discussed before, uh, uh, the public health agency has issued uh, infection prevention control guidelines that uh, all provinces have adopted. Uh, they are consistent with the World Health Organization guidelines that clearly lay out the process, which really is, for all of us, there's no recommendation of mask use. It's don't touch the surface and touch your eyes, nose, throat. Don't go out if you're unwell, cough in your sleeves. For a patient going into a facility, you may be asked to wear a mask a simple procedure mask if you can tolerate it. For healthcare providers, assessing a person who has a cough and fever and travel, you are to wear a 
procedure mask and uh, eye protection, gown and gloves, assess. Donning and doffing is important. Studies have shown that where exposure happens, it's not because of failure of wearing a procedure mask and eye protection is by touching the front of the mask and then not doing hand hygiene and touching your um, you know, and eyes, nose and mouth. So just getting the muscle memory to don and doff properly. And then where uh, uh, um, in ICU, where aerosol generating procedures are happening, like intubation, there you can use N95 masks because in those circumstances, there is a potential for airborne transmission. However, in the outpatient setting and the ER setting, the precautions are droplet and contact. We've got time for a few more questions. We've got Josh Murray, Adam, and Roberta. Just a few questions. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that these measures are in effect as of Monday when it comes to the, the numbers ban. Why wait till Monday when there's big events scheduled for tonight and this weekend in Regina I don't, and the rest of the province? I think, so events have been happening over the last week or, not, or, or being canceled. Already people have been adjusting what they're doing and not doing anyways. I think there's been a big change in how people plan events and uh, behave at those events, and that's really good. Uh, but there has to be some lead in, especially for uh, retail organizations and other sites to think through and uh, adapt policies and procedures. So this lead in is essential for them to be able to be ready by Monday. And with all these cancellations and all the, and all the, and just like the flurry of news around COVID-19, there's obviously a, a more public um, sense of like the sky is falling. What would you say to people who just want to some have some sort of normalcy in these weird times that we're in? So this is what my message is that right now our risk is low in terms of right now in terms of community transmission, but the risk can ramp up very quickly as we've seen in other jurisdictions. And what we do today can minimize the risk ramping up quickly. Having said that, we need to understand that based on our current assumptions, this is no longer something that was limited to a few countries and only came uh, over uh, occasionally. This likely will become or has become a global pandemic. So uh, you know, most of us over the course of the next uh, year or two will get exposed to COVID-19. But it's essential that through all these measures and additional measures if required, we try to prevent the rapid escalation of cases. That is vital for us as uh, you know, families and communities, and that is essential for the ability of the healthcare system to cope with an increasing number of cases. So I think those are the planning assumptions and how we deal with this. And in terms of concern, we have to recognize that Many countries have done studies on 80,000 plus uh, patients. And we have to recognize that it's a very serious illness, um, but for young adults and children, it's, it, they can be very efficient at transmitting, but the risk of serious outcomes is much lower. For older adults with underlying risk factors and seniors, the risk is higher, but even then, for people over 80, um, 85% actually get better. There is a high mortality rate for people over 80, it's 15%, much higher than influenza. But 85% even in that age group get better, but they must get the supports they need at that, if their health condition is worsening. And similarly for adults 50 to um, 80 with underlying risk factors, the uh, case fatality rate is much higher than influenza. It's between um, 5 to um, 8% which means the 90, 92% actually get better, 80% actually just by staying at home. Uh, many of the cases in Canada have been in the older age groups, they've done well staying at home. But for the few who require a high, higher level of care, it is essential to get that in a timely way and, and that um, uh, uh, you know, results in better outcomes. So, and we want to flatten the curve, I think that is essential. We want to avoid as much as we can that rapid ramp up that has been seen in some jurisdictions seen questions online that people are asking uh, specifically to the hospitality and food industry uh, restaurants I don't think there'd be too many but maybe food courts where there'd be more than 250 people uh, what about hotels and casinos so I mean those are really important things and I think businesses need to think through them uh, medical health officers will be working with those bu uh, businesses to really 
uh, work with them to explain how they can minimize um, uh, uh, control crowding, first of all, uh, and minimize uh, the risk of transmission. But did you actually, I suspect you when the rack pack was written, you didn't have to make 200 different casinos. Well, it does not say especially to uh, settings, but obviously l large organizations like retail stores, for example, can have more than 250 people. Uh, but then they have, it has to be managed that you avoid crowding as much as you can. And some of it is uh, the, something that facilities themselves organize. Some of it is how you stand in a line, for example, like in a, in a grocery store. So again, those details, I think those are important considerations for those settings. Um, but I think they need, the details have to be worked out. Do you, do you run the social control as opposed to uh, uh, owners dictating that I can only have 250 people in my store, I can only have 250 people in my casino, that kind of thing? So uh, this is not an airborne uh, infection. So in a, in a large retail organization, for example, you can have more than 250 people at any one time. You don't, don't just w want them crowding. And already, the way a lot of these retail uh, chains run, that is managed anyways, the way that's how the flow is. But it just uh, just some extra attention to that. On, the, on that, uh, from the other side of that, Marie, on our call this morning with the premiers and the prime minister and Dr. Tam, we talked, uh, one, about the the health uh, requirements and some of the investment that the federal government has made and, and some of the decisions that we were making as, as prov provincial and territorial uh, jurisdictions across across Canada from a, from a health provi provision perspective and from trying uh, initiatives to try to flatten that curve. The second conversation, part of that conversation, was to do with the impact on, on the economy and on people uh, people's wages, essentially, and, and the federal government had uh, spoken to that in their uh, funding announcement as well in the way of EI benefits as in the way of work sharing, supporting some work sharing programs. Um, but one topic of that conversation was was also uh, businesses that are operating that would feel an impact of a, of a global slowdown and we've seen that in other areas of the world. Um, but then two was self-employed individuals as they uh, often aren't in the employment insurance program or, or things of that nature. And so that's an ongoing conversation as to one, what type of structure do we have to support those that may have to self-isolate for some period of time and might be a single uh, or two-person show? Is that you're aiming at crowds as opposed to crowded places where you might be crowded in a casino or a, a, a retail store, yeah. but that's not a crowd. Somebody watching an event is going to yeah, and and, 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 and you, you can clarify uh, to this as well, Dr. Shahab, but we're, what we're trying to do is take steps to reduce the risk. Uh, we can't eliminate the risk, the but to reduce the risk, yes. To, uh, situations where obviously there'd be more, probably gathering more than 250. Yeah, uh, the, we're hearing a lot of reports about 811 being overloaded, and I know there's been some steps taken to, to staff that a little bit more heavily, but uh, the first part of the question is... You want to tell if people are having Sorry, trouble, if people are having trouble getting through to 811 and frustrated, right. what, are your, what are their options? And just a follow up to that is, um, I, I would anticipate that in the next few days, people who haven't traveled will start worrying about this, will have a weekend to think about it. Um, are there going to be measures in place to get people tested that maybe don't have a travel history, but are feeling under the weather and just want that peace of mind? So, uh, the, the Day by day, we're ascertaining uh, things like who's being tested, our access uh, to testing kits, things of that nature. And you may add to that, Dr. Shahab. On the 811 uh, access, uh, we have heard concerns with respect to people being on hold or drop calls. Uh, the minister has taken uh, some very rapid action on um, ensuring that that access to that health line is there. Um, he has some results to report here this morning, and he will. Uh, and it's an ongoing effort as well to keep increasing the capacity of the 811, 811 line. Sure, thanks, Premier. And then I'll see if Dr. Shahab wants to add and, and to the rest of your question, Adam. Um, we had some reports yesterday of people, first of all, waiting too long on uh, line, and second, having calls drop, which was extremely concerning. I talked to senior officials yesterday at the SHA, asked for an action plan today. I've had a verbal update already, and I'll be on a conference call with them later this afternoon. We've effectively more than doubled the capacity right now. Um, SASTEL has been called in to, uh, to help. They work cooperatively anyway. Um, did a lot of work overnight. Uh, the phone lines have went from 32 lines to 69 lines right now, and staff more than double as well. Um, but we're going to add to that capacity too. Uh, 
likely over the weekend, for surely next week, you're going to, we, we expect that this is going to continue to grow. Um, so we're, we're going to keep adding capacity. Doctor, I wonder if you want to. Yes, uh, I mean, if you have not traveled, <laughs> you still can talk to Healthline and express why you have concerns. Is, do you have a friend who ha had traveled internationally and was ill and never got tested and you're concerned? So I think it's still, uh, if you have concerns, to have that conversation. But right now, our assessment is the risk primarily is to people who have traveled and their close household contacts. Um, so that's what we're focusing on. But certainly, um, if things were to evolve, that recommendation could change. Just quickly back to the 811. In terms of the call volume, do we have any sort of figures as to what we're dealing with to reflect why we would actually need to double capacity? Like, how many did we normally get versus where are we now? It's, it's growing sort of exponentially, uh, especially since the announcement of the first uh, presumptive case. Um, I, I don't have exact numbers for you, but we can certainly provide those. We just expect it to continue to, uh, to increase, so we're going to err on the side of caution, and we can always scale back at some point. We heard from the FSIN this morning on a different topic that they need support, that they're really worried about their basic health care capacity up there in rural communities. Can you tell us if there's been any sort of action plan laid out to tackle the rural and isolated in the province? So that is um, of special concern to me personally. And uh, we have been having for the last several weeks uh, discussions with, for example, my counterparts, the Medical Health Officers for Indigenous Services Canada and Northern Intertribal Health Authority, as well as my counterparts in Northern Saskatchewan and, um, um, and um, Central Saskatchewan and Southern Saskatchewan. So the, you're absolutely right. There has to be an integrated approach between primary care networks within the Saskatchewan Health Authority and First Nations. And um, we have to ensure that anyone in Saskatchewan, urban, rural, remote, on reserve, has timely access to guidance through Healthline and other provide, uh, professionals, has timely access to testing, either in their community or to a health facility which is n nearby to them. And so, the, uh, and, and lastly, I would say, the mainstay of management has to be self-isolation if you're ill at home. And we need to, we have to make sure that that is possible and done in a safe manner, uh, whether it's urban, rural, or remote. That is absolutely essential for us to be successful in managing this. So those are important considerations, and we continue to have uh, you know, lengthy discussions on how that will work out in different environments. You're living alone, you have a small family, you have a large number of people living uh, in uh, crowded conditions. All those considerations are being looked at very carefully. Okay, everyone, that's all the time we have with Dr. Shahab.